Hey there, guys. Thank you for taking time to join me here in the Holy Shed. You are very, very welcome. And as you know, it's Epiphany in the church calendar, a short season that stretches between January the 6th, which is the Feast of Epiphany, through to the Feast of Candlemas, which is on the 2nd of February. And as I said last time, Epiphany is basically defined as some kind of sudden you know, revealing or appearing, a revelation, a light bulb moment when, you know, you say something like, wow, or geez. And, um, well, one way of thinking about it would be to just imagine, imagine yourself being in an art gallery in the dead of night uh, when there's no lights on and you're surrounded by wonderful Van Gogh paintings everywhere around you, but you can't see them. And they just appear as, you know, like dark, empty, shadowy frames. And then someone switches all the lights on. Whoa! You know, brilliant yellow cornfields, sunflowers, that dazzling starry night, gorgeous bright image of the painter's bedroom flooded with morning sunshine. You know, just beauty, beauty, beauty everywhere. That's Epiphany. Which is great, but... I just want to put in a qualifier, really, because, well, maybe you feel, as I do sometimes, that that's not how it works for you. You know, maybe you don't think that you've had that sort of gee whiz sort of epiphany. Uh, and, um, you know, well, that can make us feel inferior. So let me just pause to mention uh, a couple of other types of epiphanies that, you know, certainly I've experienced. I mean, to be honest... Most of my epiphanies are a lot more ordinary than that kind of dramatic kind of epiphany. You could say that they're more kind of dimmer switch epiphanies, really, than the floodlight sort. You know, the epiphanies where the light appears gradually as the switch is turned up over a period of time. And in the process, there may be some pauses here and there along the way. So, you know, it, it, it has that graduality about it rather than something that's whiz bang. Now, I suspect this, this is how most of us uh, experience epiphany, right? But do you know what? It really, really doesn't matter. Too often, in my opinion, certain kinds of Christians give the impression that whiz bang experiences of the, of, of the divine are the norm. But I don't believe that. I think that for most of us, experiences of God come much more subversively, you might say, in just ordinary mundane circumstances, in, you know, such everyday fashion that it's, that it's very easy to just write them off, to not even rate them as being spiritual or of any significance at all. And I think that's a really big mistake. I mean, if you look at many of the prayers that I write for the Holy Shed, you'll soon see that most of my revelations appear through birds and nature or through a stranger in the supermarket or, or a sunny morning when I open the curtains and it isn't grey for a change, you know, or all kinds of things like this, everyday epiphanies that are really just turning up the dimmer switch a little bit. But hey, as I say, they are none the worse for that. Also, you might have seen the quote that I gave in the prelude to Black Sheep and Prodigals from uh, the former poet laureate Andrew Motion, who says this. He says, I've seen the light and it flickers on and off like a badly wired lamp. I love that quote. I've seen the light and it flickers on and off like a badly wired lamp. How about that? What a description of flickering epiphanies, if you like. I once heard John O'Donoghue speak, uh, that wonderful Irish gift of God to us that left us far too soon. I once heard him speak of Canamara in the west of Ireland, where he lived latterly, as a place of bleakness and what he called dark epiphanies. Very John O'Donoghue. Dark epiphanies. Appearances in the mists and the rain that he said are so common in that part of the world. But yes, many of my my own light bulb moments are of the badly wired lamp variety, uh, or 
the dimmer switch variety, the sort where nothing is totally clear or beyond doubt, where I'm catching glimpses of those Van Goghs in between the bulb shaking on and off. You understand? So take all of that into account if it helps, but don't close your mind to the possibility of more dramatic epiphanies because they do happen, uh, but maybe not as often as we'd like. But today I want to focus a little bit on another of my epiphany people. Last week I introduced uh, Edwina Gately as one of my epiphany people. This time I'm going to bring a guy called Frederick Beekner into the shed. Well, not exactly, uh, because he died a few months ago in August 2022, age 96. Very sad for the world. Um, and since I'm not particularly gifted at seances, uh, I think he'll be here figuratively. But um, you'll have heard me talk about Frederick Beekner in the past. Uh, he's someone I've, I've quoted in the shed. I quote him uh, all the time, really. He's been one of my favourite Christians for about 25 years, I would think. And I can't tell you how many times I've turned to him in desperation when, you know, needing a spot of wisdom, or more especially, actually, when writing a sermon in the dead of night, uh, the, the day before and needing you know a bit of inspiration and what I love so much about Frederick Beekner is his authenticity which I can tell you has been a large source of light bulb moments for me. Fred Beekner was born in New York but he spent many years in Vermont uh, up in the northeast of the states. He was a Pulitzer winning novelist uh, a poet, an ordained Presbyterian minister, a hugely creative theologian, and really an all-round good guy, I reckon. But as I say, it was really his honesty and authenticity that won my heart, because he's one of those people who never seemed to say anything just because it was the right thing to say. You know, he definitely wasn't an echo. He was an original someone who, you know, spoke as he saw, as it were, instead of feeling that he had to fit in and um, justify what he was saying in the light of some greater body of, of, you know, Christian orthodoxy or whatever. I mean, on some points, I think he probably would have been more conservative than me. But, you know, that kind of thing has never mattered to me. I don't care about labels. I don't care how conservative or liberal a person is. Uh, it's authenticity and integrity that matters so far as I'm concerned. And basically, I respect everything that Beekner said because it's it's genuine and thought, thought through, uh, processed in life experience rather than just being cheap, if clever, theory. But make no mistake, he was, you know, a long way from being orthodox in his views. I think he's probably quite heretical in my kind of way, which is why I like him so much. So let me read you a wonderful quote from Fred Beekner. Um, I'll put it on your screen, check this out. He says here, I am a part-time novelist who happens also to be a part-time Christian. And when certain things seem real and important to me and the rest of the time not Christian in any sense, that I can believe matters. Sorry, I've read that all wrong. Let me come back to that. I'm a part-time novelist who happens also to be a part-time Christian. When certain things seem real and important to me, and the rest of the time, not Christian in any sense, that I can believe matters much to Christ or anybody else. Any Christian who's not a hero, Leon Bloy wrote, is a pig, which is a harder way, I'd say a lot harder way, of saying the same thing. From time to time, I find a kind of heroism momentarily possible, uh, a seeing, doing, telling of Christly truth, but most of the time I am indistinguishable from the rest of the herd that jostles and snuffles at the great trough of life. Part-time novelist, Christian pig. I mean, wow. <laughs> you see, see, that's what I love, his brutal unpretentiousness. I mean, part-time Christian. I don't think I've heard many people, if anybody, own up to being a part-time Christian. 
But you know, look, once we once we can ditch the term Christian as a noun, uh, as I suggest in How to Be a Bad Christian, and treat it as a, a verb instead of a noun, or once we discard the term as a badge or a label that we were and see it instead as a, a way of, of, of being in the world, a way of life, then I think we'd have to ask, who among us is anything more than a part-time Christian? Someone with a, a badly wired bulb that flashes on and off. But of course, he isn't despairing about this. He's not, he's not being denigrating about it. He isn't, you know, dishing out or absorbing guilt. He's just really being truthful and realistic as he is uh, on so many levels. And he knows that none of it, uh, you know, affects the way that God sees us or treats us. God's grace is also completely realistic and boundless and unconditional. In fact, the good news that we are loved, Beekman says, turns out to be better than we could ever uh, hope. And um, he, he says this, he says, you know, the grace of God means something like, here is your life, you might never have been, but you are because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. I love that, don't you? The party wouldn't be complete without you. And speaking about prayer, it's another sort of area where you can see his authenticity. Uh, he says this, he says, everybody prays whether you think of it as praying or not. The odd silence you fall into when something very beautiful is happening or something very good or very bad. The ah that sometimes floats out of you as out of a 4th of July crowd when the sky rocket bursts over the water. The stammer of pain at somebody else's pain. The stammer of joy at someone else's joy. Whatever words or sounds you use for sighing with over your own life, these are all prayers in their own way. I think one of the greatest epiphanies, uh, one of the greatest epiphanies for me was when I realised that faith didn't mean beliefs, that it means trust. And... It's sad, I think, that the word faith has now become synonymous with beliefs, with forms of faith, with doctrines. And some churches uh, have statements of faith, but they're not really statements of faith. They're statements of belief, which is quite a different thing. But um, the biblical term for faith doesn't mean belief, really. It means trust, not propositions. Uh, but something much more personal. Now, don't get me wrong, beliefs are important. They're important to me. Uh, you know, throughout my life, I have had a great preoccupation with beliefs. I still do, actually. I mean, my book, Black Shape and Prodigals um, and Reenchanting Christianity, these are books which are all about beliefs and how I think that um, they should be thought about and reinterpreted. But it was a fabulous, epiphanous moment for me when I realised that my faith did not depend on belief and proposition and getting them right. You know, my faith didn't depend on an affirmation of you know, the Trinity or the deity of Christ or whatever. I mean, sure, I wrestle with these kinds of things all the time but my faith isn't about those things faith isn't primarily something up here in the head um, it's down here in the gut because that's where trust exists um, you know we can think about and work out in our head things about trust but the actual experience of trust is something that's down here in the gut and uh, that, I would say, is biblical faith. And it's very much the sort of thing that I, I find comes through and through in, uh, in, in, in Beekner's writings and thought. He talks about one of his own epiphanies regarding this, regarding faith and trust. 
um, which came about when uh, one of his daughters was seriously ill. He thought he was going to lose her. And, um, and this, is, this is what he wrote about it. He said, I remember sitting parked by the roadside once, terribly depressed and afraid about my daughter's illness and what was going on in our family, when out of nowhere a car came along down the highway with a license plate that bore on it the one word out of all the words in the dictionary that I most needed to see exactly then. That word was trust. What do you call a moment like that? Something to laugh off as the kind of joke life plays on us every once in a while? The word of God. I'm willing to believe that maybe it was something of both, but for me it was an epiphany. The owner of the car turned out to be, as I'd suspected, a trust officer in a bank. And not long ago, having read an account I wrote of the incident somewhere, he found out where I lived and one afternoon brought me this, this license plate, which sits propped up on a bookshelf in my house to this day. It's uh, rusty around the edges and a little battered, and it is also as holy a relic as I have ever seen. Love that. Well, look, you know, I could talk about the lovely Fred Beekner until the cows come home, but I hope you've got a little bit of a flavour uh, of, of who he is and, and why it is that I enjoy him and love him so much and feel so sad uh, when I heard the news that he had left us, though, you know, 96 isn't bad going, is it? And um, if you want to read more of his work, you can find, well, there's, there's lots, I think he wrote about 50 books. I mean, there's loads of his books on Amazon, you know, novels and um, religious books and uh, all kinds of things. But one I'd particularly recommend, really, is this one, um, because it's uh, it's a book of daily readings, and we all like a book of daily readings, don't we? So, th I mean, this book has been, you know, spent quite a lot of time in our loo, I can tell you, but it's a book that I've, you know, come back to again and again and again um, when I've just needed to, you know, find a little bit of, well, uh, some kind of mini epiphany. Um, and I've used quotes from it all the time in uh, talks and sermons and all the rest of it. So, uh, yeah, that's what I would recommend to you, Beyond Words, a book of daily readings. So here's a prayer. God of majestic dreams and visions, of grand epiphanies which flood the landscape of imagination. God of modest light bulb moments, of glimpses of glory, with flickering badly wired lamps. God of slowly unfolding disclosure in the daily round, mundane trickling revelations of splendour. God of dusky landscapes of the soul, of deep and dazzling darkness where all is clear but none can see. You are the mysterious object of our yearning hearts, the end of all our exploring, from which we shall never cease. Amen. Referencing T.S. Eliot, of course. OK, well, let's have a toast. And if you've got a drink handy, I invite you to get it now. Um, I, I've got... <laughs> this is on special offer. Uh, but it's a litre bottle and um, it won't fit on the shelf, I'm afraid. But, you know, I'm sure I can find a little place to keep it. So... If you've got a drink, please join me now in a toast to all those moments in our life when we just glimpse something more, you know, something beyond the mundane, where I think most of our epiphanies occur. May we remain constantly aware of and open to those momentary surprises when glory and mystery and God suddenly pop into the picture. To life, Lahaim.
Marvellous. Well, thank you very much for joining me today, folks. Uh, if you like what I'm doing and you want to support us in some way, you can buy us a coffee. Just follow the link here to the coffee site or, you know, the the link is always at the top of the uh, posts on the Holy Shed Facebook page. And um, we so much appreciate all the support and love that you give us in messages that I get and, you know, emails sometimes um, and obviously coffees that you buy us. So uh, thank you so much for all of that. Uh, I'm going to finish actually with uh, a blessing which I'm sure I've used before. Uh, I mentioned John O'Donoghue earlier. This is called Banacht, which is um, a word, a Gaelic word for, for blessing. And um, it's just very classic John O'Donoghue. Um, and I hope it, it blesses you as it always does me every time I, uh, I read it or listen to it. So that's it for now, guys. Uh, I hope you have a lovely week. And um, look after yourselves. Be kind to those around you. Be kind to yourself. Stay human. And I'll see you very soon. Bye. <laughs>